Okay. Good morning. It's uh, good to have all of you on us again for the last in the series of the Earth Care Forums for 2022. And uh, I want to say again, for those of you that are new, that if you need to have a recording of a previous uh, presentation, why please let me know. My email is in the chat. And uh, also, if you want to have a list of what all this forum series were. We would appreciate all of you that have been with us and new ones and old ones that have joined us. This is about the seventh year for the Earth Care Forum. It is uh, coordinated and uh, organized by the uh, eco team of First Presbyterian Church. Uh, this church is a member of the Earth Care Congregation Network of the Presbyterian denomination. Um, to qualify, we have to meet certain kind of uh, conditions and are certified every year in different, different areas. And we're also a member of Lettuce, the Lawrence Ecology Teams United in Sustainability. And uh, that's, I hope I get them all right. It's an interfaith group of Catholic, Unitarian Universalist, Protestant, uh, Buddhist, Jewish, and Muslim uh, representatives from about 10 different faith communities uh, in Lawrence. We uh, do this, and some people have asked why there's a church involved, and we feel like it's an urgent, urgent issue for us to be uh, about earth care and that equal justice is which we address, which means working to, to heal and to defend and work toward justice for all of God's creation and all people. Well, this morning, we're really fortunate to have with us uh, Dr. Sharon Ashworth. Uh, and I want to say how nice it is for her to be with us. Or she has been uh, uh, someone who many of you already know, but I want to give you a little more background, if I may. Uh, Sharon is an ecologist and writer based here in Lawrence, and she spent her professional life working and advocating for the environment within academia. I know she's been at University of Kansas and Washburn and other places, state government and nonprofit organizations. She produced the documentary series, which some of you may have seen, which I did, were very fine, on the waters of Kansas, with funding from the Humanities uh, Council and co-authored the book, Wading Right In, Discovering the Nature of Wetlands. And I, I have that. I don't know if you can see that because you've got the screen is covered right now. But anyway, uh, it's a great book. Uh, it only took, I told her, it only took me five weeks to, to get it. <laughs> and it's from the University of Chicago Press. But if you're interested in wetlands, and it's, uh, I've begun reading, it's, it's fascinating. For the last six years, Sharon has coordinated Douglas County Master Gardeners, a group of volunteers dedicated to sharing research-based horticultural knowledge with residents here in Douglas County. And she soon, very soon, within a week, She's going to be the Horticulture and Natural Resources Agent for Kansas State Research and Extension in Douglas County. So if you have questions or comments, but please put them on the chat. She's going to keep track of those. We will have a Q&A at the end, but she doesn't mind uh, being interrupted uh, if you just put some on the chat and she feels like it's appropriate that time, she'll do it. I don't think there's anything more for me to say, but to, again, thank you, Sharon, for being with us this morning. So I'll let you have it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Thad. I am very happy to be here presenting this topic. It's a favorite of mine. Uh, but I will not be able to see the chat uh, as I go along. So, but if there is a question that you see that I should, please feel free to interrupt me, Thad, okay. if you'd like to. Um, okay. But I won't be watching the chat as I go along here. And I'll leave plenty of room at the end for questions. Uh, so, okay, as Thad said, I am with uh, K-State Research and Extension. Um, I manage the Master Gardener uh, program, a group of extraordinary volunteers, I might say. I see a few of them on. So um, thanks for being here. Uh, there, it's an amazing group of people. If you want more information about the Master Gardener program, please feel free to contact me. So let's get started with lawns, about lawns. And of course, the first button I push, I think it just been here so long it's not forwarding. There it goes. All right. So you're thinking about replacing your lawn. So you either have a lawn like the upper picture on the upper left there, where uh, lawn is sort of a weak term. It's, it's a lot of weeds. It's maybe some Bermuda grass, um, a lot of bare spots, just a whole mixture. 
So maybe you're you're tired of that. You want something um, that maybe looks better or provides for um, the environment a bit more than what you're currently seeing. You might have the lawn up in the upper right there where you've got a perfectly healthy lawn. It looks great, but you've decided you're, you're tired of taking care of it and you want to replace it. So the picture below uh, might be what you have in mind. When you think about replacing a lawn, you want something pretty, you want something flowering, you want something the neighbors will enjoy. Uh, so let's talk about how you get there. So first we'll take um, a little bit of time to say why it is that most of what you see is lawn um, in our neighborhoods rather than the bottom picture. Replacing the lawn. So first of all, um, the reason we have so much lawn is it's sort of baked into the lawn. our evolution. Leaving where it. we, oh. it's like the lady down the street from Mark and Amy where the house is. Okay, where uh, our evolution, where we prefer wide open views. We like to see what's coming. We have an enemy or a predator. Uh, so it's kind of baked into us. Um, to prefer wide open views. Um, and there are a number of resources for the history of lawns and they're very fascinating. So I'm just um, highlighting a few points here. Um, so by the 13th century, um, people are actually starting to have deliberate open spaces with low vegetation, sort of the modern kept turf. And of course this is managed either kept short um, by human labor or grazing, uh, animal grazing. Uh, the village green in Northern Europe became popular by the 16th century. And once again, um, kept there, there in Northern Europe, they got plenty of cool weather, plenty of moisture, uh, lots of grazing animals, uh, using human labor to keep those spaces open. Okay, so what we're thinking about when we think about these spaces is they're for safety, for recreation, and common space. And of course, golf. We had golf around by the 17th century. That's what this uh, diagram is about. This drawing here is golf in the 17th century. And you can see it's a little bit different uh, than our golf courses today. And these sorts of places were managed by sheep grazing for the most part. Now, when we get to the private lawns, private lawns were originally for the wealthy because you needed labor. You absolutely had to have labor to maintain this. So it was only the wealthy who could maintain a private lawn. And this, this, this aesthetic was brought over from Northern Europe. Now, post-World War II is when we see what we, we, what we look around we see today, the suburban lawn. That's what we're seeing. That was post-World War II uh, when suburbia was starting to be built out. Levittown <coughs> deliberately um, put up these small houses uh, and, and lawns. Each of those new houses had its own little lawn. Um, and then the, also post-World War II, you see the advent of affordable power mowers, individual uh, power mowers, um, and of course, fertilizers and pesticides after World War II. And research really took off on turf grass varieties to find what would work best um, in the United States. And so it became a middle-class status symbol. You, you were on your way, you had your house, you had a little patch of lawn. So let's take a look at some of the pros and cons of a lawn. So first of all, I have to say, you know, grass is certainly better than bare dirt. Um, turf grasses are plants. Um, they're gonna filter water and air. They're gonna absorb carbon dioxide. They're gonna produce oxygen. Um, it does reduce erosion, improves water infiltration. If you think about, you know, concrete or hard packed earth, um, if you're going to have a healthy lawn there, it's going to help with water infiltration. Um, it's going to be aesthetically pleasing. It provides for recreational space and it feels good when you run around on a good lawn. Um, so there are definite pros to having a lawn, which, and be, which is why people like them. They serve a purpose. So, but unfortunately, this purpose takes a lot of effort. Um, you need to apply herbicides, fungicides, insecticides, fertilizer, and water, and you have to mow it. So let's take a look at some of the highlights of the cons. Uh, 
I put a few things up here. There's a lot of um, information on there about uh, statistics with regard to the lawn. Uh, but I do have to say it is definitely the largest irrigated crop we have in the United States. Um, and there's a figure from this reference uh, two, from 2019 about lawns in the United States. And what I want to emphasize is this middle statement here is that you may have just a small patch of lawn, and but if these millions of acres uh, that we have out there in lawn, if everybody's putting fertilizer and using water, um, it does add up. We're talking continental scale environmental changes as a result of this, this cumulative action um, to maintain our lawns. And another interesting uh, piece from this paper that I read is that knowing your neighbors, if you have a tight-knit community and you know a lot of your neighbors, that neighborhood actually is likely to use more water and fertilizer uh, to maintain the lawns. And that gets to this notion of peer pressure. Uh, if you know your neighbors and your neighbors keeping their lawn nice and neat, you feel more pressure to keep your lawn nice and neat. But I highlight this particular thing because it can go the other way too. I mean, if you think about peer pressure being a significant reason of how we keep our spaces um, in our, where we live, um, then if more and more people started doing alternatives to lawn, I think it would work as well as you see more and more people putting down some kind of alternative to lawn. So that peer pressure, um, I'm thinking, could also be useful um, if we start to replace our lawns. So just uh, some highlights of that. So that first quote up there is that's 40 million acres. Um, now the latest statistic I found was 2005. I'm, I'm, I imagine there, there might be a more updated figure, but that's what I, what I found. Um, and some, an example of some of these continental scale problems that we're seeing due to this many acres and lawns is loss of biodiversity. There are um, lots of studies coming out showing that if we increase the diversity in our more densely populated areas and living arrangements, uh, that we can make an impact on pollinator habitat. And of course, there's the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. If you haven't heard about that, um, lot, lots of fertilizer. Um, it's not just the farms. Um, there's a great deal of fertilizer runoff from our urban and suburban landscapes when we fertilize our lawns. Uh, and then once again, the upshot of this is higher incomes and perceived social norms result in increased inputs of water, fertilizer, and pesticides. So alternatives. So an alternative to a lawn, and we'll get into the various uh, options that you might have in a moment, but it's gonna provide for all those things I set, showed up above, um, they're plants. So it's gonna, they're gonna filter air and water, uh, and provide cooling for the environment, water infiltration. But if you replace the turf grasses with something else, you get all that plus you, you have flowering plants, you're gonna get pollinators. You're gonna get uh, pollinators that will support a diverse ecosystem. Uh, most of the alternatives we're gonna talk about do not require fertilizers, pesticides, and water, uh, or at least as much as the lawn does. And there's no need to use a gas powered engine to maintain this, uh, to main alternatives. Now I have, there are some caveats depending on what you replace your lawn with, uh, because you can't get away with no water on most things. And there are some alternatives that you might want to mow. And if you have a gas powered engine, it's just so you're gonna reduce that, that mowing. So let's look at our options for replacing a lawn. So if you look out of your lawn and you have that initial picture that I showed you with the dandelion and the scruffy lawn, it might be that what you want is really a healthier lawn. When people call into the extension office uh, and the horticulture hotline that we have, um, having a conversation with these people, it might be that they're struggling to plant grass and they say, my lawn looks terrible. You know, I live in the city and I have these trees. And as you talk to them, you realize that what they really want is just a healthier lawn. Um, and that's okay to have a healthier lawn because a healthier lawn is gonna be better for the environment than a scruffy lawn. And I'll explain in a minute. 
So it could be no change. You've kind of got, you don't have that, that sort of mono, uh, uh, that what people traditionally think of as a gorgeous lawn, deep green, no weeds, no flowers. Um, you might have a lawn, but you've got some violets and clovelins. And maybe that's okay. You're just gonna you're just gonna stop putting the inputs necessary to get rid of all the violets and clover, um, and you're just gonna accept them. You will learn to love the violets and the clover. Um, another option is some change. You do want an alternative that looks somewhat like a lawn, meaning you want it short. You don't want like that initial picture I showed where you've got tall flowering plants. Um, you want something that kind of looks like a lawn, but you don't, but it's better for the environment, better for pollinators, and you don't have to care for it as much. And then there's the final one is you're just going to rip it all up and you're going to do something wild and crazy. Um, and you're going to put, you're going to install uh, a, a native plant landscape that's different from your lawn. So we'll go through each of these um, alternatives. So. What if it is, what you really want is a healthier lawn. You're not re ready to go all the way with replacing your lawn. You, you want lawn, you want, you have kids um, that wanna play, grandkids that wanna play on a recreation space. Uh, you feeling like maybe, maybe you, have, you live in a place that was a homeowner's association and there's only so much you can do because the homeowner's association says you can't put something in. But if you're going to, create a healthier lawn, it's going to be fewer inputs in the long run. So in order to renovate that from that picture on your left, it's going to take a lot of work to get it to the picture on the right, to look like the picture on the right. But once you get there, uh, and I have the tall fescue grass is the typical lawn around in this area. So once you get there, though, you do have to maintain it. So it is going to take aeration and some herbicides and fertilizing. But once you get to that healthy lawn, as long as you maintain that healthy lawn, you're going to reduce those inputs. It's going to take over time less herbicide, less fertilizer, um, and less receding to do that. So, and we have a lot of resources for that if you're in that situation where you want to maintain a healthy lawn. But maintaining a healthy lawn is going to be better for the environment um, than what you see on the left. Because what's on the left a lot of times is a lot of compact ground, a lot of bare ground. It doesn't allow for water infiltration as much. And people, a lot of people, at least certainly the people that call in the office, they don't want this. Even though it's got flowers in it and it's going to provide for the pollinators more than the picture on the right, uh, most people don't want what's on the left. And that also is an indication of a lot of compaction on the soil, in the soil. Okay. So you're going to keep the lawn, but you're going to reduce what the two key things to do to improve a lawn is to reduce its size, so don't have as much of it, and to reduce the inputs. So you're going to limit it to the sunny areas, because that's where grass grows best, is in the sunny areas. I get a lot of phone calls from people there, there's all those bare areas, bare dirt um, under a tree. And it just, it's, it doesn't do a lot to try to, and I, I try to steer them away from trying to grow grass under trees in the city. The competition for water in those situations, the grass, grass is too much. The, the trees are gonna take the water um, and the shade, or the water, competition for water and light is gonna mean that you can't grow grass under a tree. So that, so you reduce the, your lawn area by taking, taking away those areas and planting something else. Or you're going to use a lawn to, to separate parts of your landscape. Maybe you want a little bit for recreation. Maybe you want a little bit of lawn so you can walk in between your garden beds. So in those places where you have lawn, the sunny areas and the walking spaces, you need to create a thick, healthy lawn, which is going to reduce the amount of inputs you put um, into that space. So we have a publication. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to send out a PDF of this presentation so you can have the hot links if you like. Um, so here are some resources from K-State. We've got a, a, a plan, a, it just goes through the year. Here's what you do to get a healthy lawn. And that's what's in that publication right there, the tall fescue lawns. Um, so lots of information on how to maintain a healthy lawn. Uh, so, and the key piece to uh, what you're doing, whether you're creating a native landscape or um, a healthy lawn out there, um, getting a soil test. 
is a great way to start, um, particularly if you're trying to maintain a lawn, because what this does is it tells you how much fertilizer you need to apply. So you put, bring a soil sample into the extension office. We send it off to K-State Soil Lab, comes back with recommendations for fertilizer. Because one of the big problems is, is people over fertilize. And when you over fertilize your lawn, that runs off, goes into the drain and goes to our water bodies. So if you get a soil test and you know the proper amount and when, proper amount and when to fertilize, you're gonna be putting down the fertilizer that your lawn needs and the excess is not gonna be running off, eventually getting to our water bodies. So just doing that step helps a lot. So, and watering, you're going to water a lawn. Here's the thing that sort of gets me is that it, there are other places that do things differently, but here in this area, we use our treated drinking water for our lawns. It's expensive and it's wasteful. Um, to water with drinking water on our lawns. So there is advice for how to do that effectively. So if you have a tall fescue lawn that you're trying to maintain, you don't need to water for the most part in the spring. Now, the caveat here is our weather is weird. Um, so we never know dry, wet as the seasons go because climate change has just sort of wrecked our traditional um, year. But in the spring, generally, if you get some rain, you're not gonna really need to water that grass. It's not, it's not ready for water. It doesn't need that much water. During a dry summer, the key is to water deeply and infrequently. This is healthier for the lawn, the grass, and it saves on water. You don't wanna just throw on a little bit of water every day during the drought. Um, you just need to water deeply. And by watering deeply, what that means, it's usually an inch to an uh, inch and a half at a time. And the best way to do this is you turn your sprinkle on and put a tuna can out there and just let it see there and see how long it takes to fill that tuna can. And that's how much water you need once or twice a week during a dry spell. Um, so then you can time your water and you know how much, you know when to shut it off. And then in the fall, if it's dry just every other week, so this is gonna save you water if you're using drinking water to water your lawn. And then there's a bunch of resources. Like I'm not gonna go through these. I just want you to know that they're available from K-State uh, and um, I'll provide that with the hot links for this. Um, so one of the things that we recommend always in our publications is uh, good management first. So good management, is gonna mean you might not have to go to that second step of chemical control for weeds. So focus on the good management. That's why a healthy lawn is better for environment than an unhealthy lawn if you don't like weeds. So, so, so there's a bunch of resources. I'll make sure that gets to you. So let's look at another option. Let's say you're, you really don't, you're not looking for that, that absolutely you know, green, um, not a weed, not a blade out of place type of lawn. You're going to be okay with these flowers because honestly, violets are pretty. Um, so, and, and they're beneficial. So you might just leave the violets in clover and not try to do weed control in your lawn. Um, so the violets ho are a host for fritillary butterflies, caterpillars, um, and clover fixes nitrogen in the soil and it provides nectar for pollen and bees. So this is better for the environment and better for pollinators um, than the not a blade out of place type of grass. So, and you can create this deliberately. Um, this is probably more bee friendly lawn by seeding bare areas. Like if you have some bare areas or the weeds are too much, you can always take out those patches, um, scrape them up and reseed with a mis mix of fescue grass and clover. And that's going to be a little better. Uh, it's going to fix nitrogen. It's going to provide for pollinators. And the dandelions, you know, some people think they're pretty yellow, and then they dig them out when they get all puffy and white. Or um, if you really don't like, if you can't handle that, it's just too much to have a dandelion. Go ahead and and, and dig those out. So you want some change. So you really want to reduce the amount of grass in your lawn. You want to not mow so much. Um, you want it to look pretty. Uh, so you're going to change it to somewhat, but you still need uh, something that's short. 
Uh, it, so you, you're not ready to go for the full blown uh, garden look. So you want some short things. So a great place for information on this is University of Minnesota has done an excellent job of researching what they call bee friendly lawns. And here are the species that the, the plants that they recommend putting into a bee friendly lawn. Now, none of these are native, but they are providing for pollinators and they can tolerate some mowing. So if you still need an area that you can walk on, maybe, you know, kick a ball around on, um, and that you just don't have to mow as often, but you can mow it and these species will tolerate that. So we've got self heal, we've got white clover, we've got creeping thyme, and it helps to mix this with fine fescues. Most of what we have um, in our lawns is tall fescue, um, but the recommendation is for the fine fescues. And the reason we recommend mixing this with grass is because if you're going to go with the self heal and the clover and the creeping thyme, sometimes that can get really patchy. It's a more open growing uh, landscape. And so it actually leaves open spaces for maybe the weedier things that you don't want um, in your lawn if you want. So mixing it with fine fescues is gonna give you that sort of that, maybe that look you want, but it's gonna, you're gonna add flowers. And it's best to have it mixed. The matrix behind all that is the, is the fescue grass um, because that, keeps the soil covered, it keeps roots in the soil, and it prevents weeds. But well, the types of, these are all actually probably considered weeds, um, but the undesirable weeds, we'll, say, we'll leave it at that. Okay, here's another option. Um, if you want some change and you still want short stature plants. Uh, so, and there's some, some native options here. So you can look at sedges. Um, some sedges can get um, uh, about a, a foot tall in the flower stalk, but a lot of sedges, you're still talking, you're talking under a foot, maybe six to eight inches with um, the sedges. So Carex pennsylvanica um, actually tolerates shade. Um, so that's something you can grow under um, some shade under your, uh, we have a, a honey locust that's in front of our office and we have Carex pennsylvania growing under it and it's lovely. Uh, and it, so it covers, covers the soil and it gives you that sort of uniform lawn look, but you're not going to mow this like you would grass. And it's a native to Missouri. So close. And also Carex albicans is another option. Um, it's more tufted look, so it doesn't have that more uh, uniform lawn look. It's got a little more tufts. And so you've got space in between there that you might um, have some weeds pop up. Uh, the other thing about carrots is they're typically planted with plugs, which means it's pretty expensive to replace a large area um, with sedges, but you might find some small areas. You could start replacing that lawn with some of the carrots using smaller areas. Another option, um, if you've got a bright sunny area and you don't wanna grow, grow tall fescue because of the fertilizer and the water and herbicides, you can try a native grass. Um, buffalo grass uh, is a little harder to grow in this part of Kansas, in the eastern section of Kansas. It's more out west. But if you have a bright sunny spot, it could work. So that picture there on the lower left is buffalo grass, and that's my lawn. I took out my one little patch of, well, I can't say I had grass. It was mostly Bermuda grass and weeds. And I took that all out. And I planted plugs of buffalo grass. And honestly, it looks fabulous. I am so excited about having this. I did it as an experiment to see if I could recommend it here in Lawrence. But this is um, towards the edge where you see that chair. I've got an overhanging um, elm tree. So on the edge, it's pretty thin. So if you want to plant buffalo grass, it's got to be full sun, six to eight hours of sun. And you can plant buffalo grass seed as well. You don't have to do with blue grandma grass or buffalo grass, you can plant with seed. So it's a little cheaper um, if you've got a larger area. Now, the thing about these sorts of grasses is they can be a little, the canopy of the plant over the soil is a little thinner than a fescue. So you will have to pay a little bit more attention to it in terms of weed control. 
than you would a thick fescue grass. Um, but if you're game for it, um, like I am, it's just this little patch. So I can go out, I go out there and I just, I just pluck things out. It's sort of my Zen moment where I'm out in my yard and I'm just plucking the weeds out. And blue grandma grass is also another option that needs to be done. And it gets a little taller um, with blue grandma grass. So depending on how tall you want it, and both these grasses can be, can be mowed. They're just not as often. And you don't have to, you don't have to water them once they're established. So that's an option. Whoops. I thought I, so now we're going to talk to, I thought I had the rip it up part next, but let's see. So before we get into planting natives, uh, more the, that picture initially that I showed you when you've got a lot of the tall uh, forbs, the wildflowers, I want to uh, take a moment to describe what I mean by a native plant. Um, so a native plant has evolved and adapted to a specific location. So here's just a couple definitions. So the key here is that this, these plants have evolved in concert with our soils, our climate, and our pollinators. So the flora and fauna have evolved together. So that's what I mean by native. So why do we plant the natives? Why, there is quite an interest in this now. I get more and more phone calls about planting natives and it's really taken off interest all around the country in planting natives um, in other countries as well. So first and foremost, you probably think of um, our native pollinators. So this is a, just a picture of a poster of our backyard bees. And this always astonishes me every time I see it because there are that many uh, species of backyard bees. Uh, so these pollinators, have evolved with the native flora. So we want to support them. The, de the it's alarming decline in our native pollinators. And it's not just the, it's not just what you typically think of as flowering plants with the bright flowers. Grasses are important too. Grasses are flowering plants. Um, you just, they're just not as showy uh, as our, our forbs. So this is a list from the University of Minnesota about, these are a list of caterpillars of these particular butterflies that feed on just little blue stem, one of our native grasses. And I just think that's astonishing. So don't forget that grasses also support pollinators. So natives, one another reason, they, they provide for our native pollinators but they are lower maintenance, much lower maintenance than you would have in a tall fescue lawn. But it's not no maintenance. You gotta emphasize that. You do, you can't just throw a bunch of native seed out there or plant a, a big plot of native grasses and forbs and call it good. It does take some maintenance. So why are they an improvement? Um, they're, it's adapted to our local conditions. Local conditions, that's why they're, they're native plants. They, they, can, they understand Kansas, Northeast Kansas, Southwest Kansas, they understand what the, the deal is um, and can handle the diseases and the pests and the cold and the heat and uh, the soil types. So because they're adapted um, to our area, they're heat and drought tolerant, um, they're not, they're going to make it through a Kansas summer, uh, more so than any introduced species. And of course, all this means that they take less, that no fertilizer, if you're gonna plant native plants, you're not gonna put any fertilizer on there. And you're not gonna put any pesticides on it because you're trying to attract pollinators. So you're not gonna put pesticides on there. And you're not gonna put fertilizer on there because fertilizer, as I'll tell you in a minute, doesn't really work well with native plants and far less water. So uh, just a brief, so a lot of people ask about natives versus native ours. So I just want to make sure when you go out to the garden store and you're thinking about planting natives, uh, let me tell you how to distinguish between a native and a native var. So a native var is just a cultivar of a native plant. It's been manipulated by selective breeding um, to highlight a particular desirable trait, a particular color, particular size, uh, a particular aesthetic. Uh, so, and most of these native R's are propagated through cloning. So how you tell when you're at a garden store 
um, is if it has one of these fancy names on it. So our cone flower, our genus, the genus cone flower is Echinacea, but you'll see this little X there and then some name in quotes and, you know, like snow cone. You can think of all the fancy things. It's like, uh, uh, you know, purple, purple rain and castles on the sky. I mean, there's all kinds of crazy names out there um, for various different cultivars, but that's how you know it's a cultivar. Uh, or a native bar. And there's another example there where it's got one of these. This one says, I think, white swan uh, for your cone flower. So this is been, this is a native plant, our echinacea, that has been selectively bred for the white petal, the white cone flower. So there's our native echinacea right there. And we have uh, come up with some pretty crazy native arts for this. I'll show you some pictures. So there's the, the white petal one, and there's some with some funky petals there. And there's another one. That one's really, that I would have never recognized that as coming from an echinacea. There's one there. And that one's quite pretty, but these are all various cultivars um, that came from the native echinacea. So the benefits of picking native bars, there are some benefits. So the traits smooth, like I said, there's color, there's height, style of bloom, there's, they're, they're bred for disease resistance. Um, and these native bars are more available than straight natives oftentimes. When you go to your regular garden centers, whether it's the big box or even the small ones, oftentimes what's available are native bars rather than the straight natives. Um, the concerns we have about native ours in some instances are one pollination. If you look at that picture on the right there, um, the, it's been modified such that it's likely that that is not going to help native pollinators. So the one on the, uh, on the upper right where the, it's just the color that's been, been manipulated, that might be okay for pollinators. Uh, there's a, a lot of research um, working on this topic now of natives versus native ours and their benefits to pollinators. And it's really, it's kind of mixed. Um, the results are really mixed on what sometimes the native, sometimes pollinators prefer native ours. Um, sometimes they don't. It's a real mixed bag right now. But one, a couple of things we have, the research has beginning to show is that if the, the bloom shape has changed, that generally is a detriment to pollination. Um, color, not so sure um, if that's, and the other thing that we don't have a lot of information on is uh, the leaf chemistry and how that might affect um, host plants um, when caterpillars are feeding. We don't know what the if the nutrient quality has changed at all. So natives, native ours, um, a lot of times uh, one of our master gardeners who's an, just a fa fabulous native plant gardener, she uses native ours because they're shorter. A lot of times, if you're just going to get a native bar that's just short, that's going to help you out. You can still plant a native in your yard, but it's not going to get big and rangy. You can get a dwarf variety, and that's actually a really good thing. Um, so just uh, uh, natives and native equivalents. These are from Applied Ecological Services. They've recently changed their names, but it's the nursery down in Baldwin that grows a lot of natives. Um, so. This non-native astilbius is something that's very common, especially if you're looking at shaded areas. And so um, they might recommend something called a foam flower. But the problem with a lot of natives, is you have to be careful when you start native gardening, because um, some of these things can get quite aggressive. So in this case, that one spreads rapidly. Miscanthus is a very common grass um, in landscapes. It's, it is a non-native. And so the recommendation might be to plant Indian grass, one of our big native grasses. But boy, if it's if you've got um, if you've got a very tended garden, if you've got fertilizer, you've got a lot of organic matter in that soil, um, it's a well taken care of yard. That thing is going to flop. It is going to be a mess in your yard um, if you've got a nutrient. This is something you plant out in maybe the way back of the yard that you haven't been taken care of. So this likes areas that you're you are not going to take you are not going to take care of because it's just going to get big and floppy um some things you have to worry about when you're doing natives um some things spread very aggressively um i when i first started as a master gardener i really didn't know what i was doing 
um, and planted some things in a garden. And boy, some subsequent master gardeners have just cursed these plants um, to this day. We still see this equisetum there on the, the horsetail on the left popping up everywhere. It's a nightmare to get rid of. It goes everywhere. Um, spiderwort is a very, that middle one with purple flower, it's pretty. Um, and it's highly recommended in a lot of native plant mixes, but it'll spread. You can, you can, you can take care of it if you want. You can keep pulling it out. Um, so basically what I'm saying is you just be careful when you're doing natives, because what we don't want is for people to go out, plant natives, and then, and then just say, oh, this is just too much. I can't, it, it's running everywhere. And, and, and then actually be very really disappointed in the fact that they've replaced their lawn with natives. Um, and like I said, if you've got a nice area, uh, this is actually a little patch of natives I tried to plant. And I'm actually having to take some of this out and try to find shorter stuff because I don't have enough sun. Um, the soil has some nutrients in it and it's in a cared for place. And I get a lot of floppy plants um, because of that. Um, if something says full sun, plant it in full sun because you'll get it to grow in partial sun, but it's gonna, it's gonna start to flop and it won't bloom as well. Um, so really sort of uh, plan your area. So, and, and just some work, here's some uh, pictures of some shorter stuff um, that you won't have to worry about flopping or anything, but can really cover some ground, especially in shady areas. So this wild ginger here on the left, and golden ragwort, those are two natives that do well in the sun and can cover ground and are flowering plants. Um, ajuga is what is normally recommended. You, if you have a shady area and you want to replace your lawn, this ajuga is, a, but you know, that's okay. If this is what's going to work in your lawn, oftentimes I'll talk with people on the phone and they want to replace, they have a shady area, they want to replace some lawn, um, but they, they're having trouble finding natives. Um, they need something that's going to work in dry shade. They really don't want to maintain anything. And sometimes things like ajuga there or the what's called the liriope, the monkey grass, sometimes that's the, the best suggestion, especially if you have a hill that you don't want to mow, you don't want to maintain, it's in the shade. It's, um, sometimes you just need to cover ground to prevent erosion. And um, ajuga, that supports pollinators, so does liriope. Um, so a mix of natives and non-natives, that you don't have to be pure about this. The other thing um, you wanna think about um, is formal versus informal. Uh, do you want a maintained stylized bed like on the left there? Um, so you're gonna be planting plugs or pots of plants, or do you want an informal meadow? where you can go with seeds and plant a patch of your yard with seeds. Um, so here are your options for getting rid of your existing lawn in whatever form it is. Um, you can go ahead and kill that lawn with a glyphosate. Um, I'm not, this, I can't say endorse this particular product um, there, but glyphosate, um, it's also, also commonly called Roundup, um, will get rid of your lawn. You can till it up. Um, that's the upper middle. You can use a sod cutter uh, here on the upper right, um, or you can bake your grass, um, your existing lawn under clear plastic, under cardboard and mulch, or under black plastic, and put that on there for this summer coming up. Um, that's what, if you have a patch of lawn, you're thinking you're going to convert over. Um, I do highly recommend covering it with plastic or cardboard and mulch and let it bake through the summer um, and then planting in the fall. That's an excellent way to do that. And then you're either gonna plant potted plants or plugs of plants or you're gonna plant seed, um, depending on how big an area you have. And here you might choose whichever method uh, works for you depending on the size of the yard. I mean, it's one thing to cover a little patch of a suburban lawn with black plastic. It's another if you're working with an acre. If you're, you're out in the country and you've got that big giant lawn out in front and you're tired of mowing, um, doing plastic is going to be, it's going to be tough. 
Um, so that's where you might want to go with something more like a, a, a tiller or the herbicide. Um, and if you're going to do an informal meadow, um, you're going to go ahead and seed uh, versus maybe a smaller form of plot where you'd be able to do and afford um, plugs or plants. The key is, is variety. Um, if you want to attract the most pollinators to your yard, you need variety. Variety of color, bloom time, form, um, and variety of purpose. So by variety of purpose, I mean you want nectar plants, you want host plants for the caterpillars. In this case, you want the insects to eat your plants. It's okay to have chewed plants, munch plants, because that's what they're there for. They're there for the pollinators and the caterpillars. So um, you, need, you want the, the insects to eat your plants. Um, and what I call buffet plants um, for hungry birds, because they want to come in and they want to eat the insects um, that are on your plants. And a great resource for plants that are good for birds is the Jayhawk Audubon Society. Um, they have a website, on their website, they have a section that's plants for birds. Uh, and it's an excellent resource for uh, plants that host a lot of um, caterpillars for hungry birds. So all this is gonna increase uh, your contribution to biodiversity in this area. So just a little, some tips for when to do this, if you're thinking about it. Um, if you're going to use potted plants, plugs, you're going to, um, you can plant them spring or fall. In the seeds, if you're going to seed an area, once you've killed whatever's there, you know, the weeds and the lawn, once that's gone, once that vegetation is gone, um, you're actually going to seed in January is the recommended, or sometime during the winter. You want to seed during the dormant season. Um, and there's lots more details, and I'll give you a resource for how to do this. Um, and the first year, if you've got plugs, you're going to water till established. And the seeds, you're going to water, you, well, depending on how big an area you have, you can water it. If you've got a really huge area, then, then we, it, you just go with the rainfall. Um, you're going to mow with that first flush of weeds in the spring on the highest setting on your mower. Uh, and then you're going to water that first year, essentially. But after that, you really don't need to worry about it so much. And here's the resource that gives detailed instructions on how to go about um, planting natives, whether you want a formal garden, you want an informal meadow, you want a large area. Um, and this is something that came out about well, 2020, I think, I kind of lost track. There's the website. We don't have any more hard copies left, uh, but uh, this has uh, five publications to it. So you can pick out um, gardening with natives um, for when you're just trying to tuck natives into your existing landscape. Um, landscaping with natives is bigger areas, maybe some formal gardens, maybe some informal meadows. But we've also got a publication, if you're out in the country and you've got some land you want to convert, um, we also have a, a booklet for reconstructing prairie, restoring prairie, and then um, for adding natives around crop, existing cropland. Um, so that's all at that website. And that gives sort of the details of how to go about doing this. It also has a source uh, where to get plants and seeds. Um, and I'm gonna be trying to update this in this coming year. So to make it available and it'll be on, available on the website because these things change um, each year. So I'll be trying to update it this year. Um, so there's a lot of sources of native plants it's like I said, they're hard to find in the garden centers, um, but we have other options. And then if you have any comments on using the guide, uh, we'd love to have, um, we'd love to have your opinions on how easy it was to use the guide and how helpful it was, and maybe some ideas for what else we could include for growing natives. This is actually a, 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 the area around the lead center, out in front of the lead center that one of our master gardeners, Susan Rendell planted. Uh, as an example that you can go and look at as a large sort of formal bed of natives. It's right in front of the lead center. It's a great example of what you can do. And then I have a list of other resources um, for native landscaping. And like I said, I'll give this to Thad um, so you can have these resources, but these are all excellent, excellent resources 
um, for planting natives in addition to the K-State materials. There. Okay, okay. I'm back and leave that one there. So um, just a bit, just wanna end with saying, you know, it is possible, anything you do, uh, adding a little bit of diversity to your lawn um, helps. It reduces the inputs and increases, uh, increases diversity for pollinators even just a little bit. So, and if you need any advice, please call the Extension Master Gardeners. Okay, thank you, Sharon. I think we've got some comments and questions. I'm gonna start off with one of the last comments here. Okay. Asked, uh, how about the foods, not lawns approach? How are you, what's your comments on that? Oh yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent way to go. You can try, I know that there's a lot of, um, sort of the, the green leafy things um, that people like to add in their landscape, like chard and kale. Uh, so if you've got uh, spaces where you can tuck in some vegetables, even a single tomato plant or some chard in there with the flowers, go for it. That's an excellent idea. Okay. How many naturally landscape yards are you aware of in Lawrence? Well, um, there's the deliberate uh, native yards and the, the ones that are basically because someone stopped mowing. Um, and I don't remember, I don't recommend the, the, the part of the just stopping mowing and let's, letting it grow what's there. Uh, basically because it's a lot of weeds that may spread to your neighbors. Uh, it doesn't look so great um, in a neighborhood. You might get the city, if you're in the city, um, somebody might give a call to the city if you just stop mowing and let grow what's there. So it helps to be a little bit deliberate about that. And I don't honestly see many deliberately created native, native lawns, in, at least in Lawrence. I don't see that. Most of what I see are people who are not who are not watering, not fertilizing, not putting herbicides down, but are maybe mowing. So I see a lot of lawns that have clover and violets in it. And that's a lot better than, than putting all the fertilizer and herbicide on the lawn. So that's what I see mostly is people not uh, feeling the pressure um, to, to fertilize and to put herbicides on, okay. at least in the parts of town that I, that I travel in. And is uh, are native ours uh, perennial? And in the case of native coneflowers, are the medicinal properties diminished or altered from the native varieties? Uh, that is a really good question. And I do not know the answer about the medicinal properties. Um, that I have not seen research on that. Maybe, maybe somebody else has come across that. Uh, but I don't know the answer about the medicinal properties. That's an excellent, excellent question. Okay. Well, I've got a question here about when a new subdivision is approved, uh, could our local land use code place a site plan condition on it that requires a portion or all of it be planted in natural landscaping? Well, um, a couple things about that. Uh, if a new subdivision goes in and there is a homeowners association attached to that, then that's gonna depend on the homeowners association what they will allow. In instances like that, and, and in neighborhoods, the existing neighborhoods, what I recommend is being deliberate about what you're doing and adding signage. You just put up a sign saying, I'm trying to support pollinators. That's why my lawn looks different. And getting a conversation going with your neighbors. Because it could be, what, remember what I said up front is peer pressure matters. And so if more and more people put yards, um, replace their yard. Now, so for instance, I replaced my front yard. It was, you know, yard is, it, it didn't have a good crop of grass on it. So I replaced it with a number of different ground covers, but I don't have a lot of people coming up to me and saying, hey, I want a yard like yours. So obviously I have to work on that a little bit. Um, but if, you, if you're deliberate about it um, and you put up signage, I think that helps a lot. And people kind of understand uh, what you're trying to do and appreciate what you're trying to do and maybe try to mimic what you're trying to do. 
So that could help in an area, an existing neighborhood, um, and with a homeowners association, maybe. Now, as part of the land development code, I'll just make a plug. Um, coming up right here, I'm, I also serve on the Lawrence um, Douglas County Planning Commission. And we are going to be sort of redoing the land development code coming up in the next several months. Um, so if you have ideas and you want some input into that process, um, then contact the planning staff once we get started. There'll be an announcement in the paper when, then when the consultant is selected, we will be going through our land development code. But those are the sorts of things we need to be looking at in the land development code is what can we do to promote and encourage uh, things like native landscaping? So good question. Well, good. And uh, I think most of you may see on the chat that Hillary uh, Noonan in Kansas City is saying they're, they're working on changing the rules on native yards in oh. Kansas City. So that in right. a case may be a resource there. Uh, yeah, and Hillary, if, you, if you've got more to, to say, just go ahead and type up, you know. And... Yeah. Does it help to shear tall natives such as goldenrod to avoid flopping when it flowers? Yes, you can do that with many of the native plants is you can um, um, pinch them back as they're growing. And so by the time they bloom, they're at a shorter stature. So you can do that um, earlier in the growing season is sort of um, cut those back a bit so that they end up being a little um, bushier and not so floppy. So yes, you can do that to many native. Mm -hmm. And then we got a question. Can brown paper sacks with no ink be used to get rid of front lawn grass? Um, sure, yeah. Instead of cardboard, um, you can put newspaper down, regular news. That's, that's something that we, a lot of people have a lot of. You can always put newspaper down in mulch. Uh, the thing about getting rid of your grass first, especially if it's a lawn that has a lot of what you call weeds in it, um, is they're going to keep coming back. Um, so. It does take some effort. So once you, if you've killed the lawn um, with paper or plastic over the summer and you take that up, as soon as you take that cover up, there'll be a flush of weeds. So you might want to wait until that flush of weeds happens and try to get rid of a sort of a go, a second go round with um, either uh, tilling it up, um, scraping those weeds off or killing them with herbicide. And I know a lot of people don't like to use herbicides. And it, so it works if you've got a small space. If you've got a really large space, um, one thing I caution is you don't want to be fighting weeds forever and ever. So in the long run, it might be beneficial. If you have a large area that you're dealing with, like we recommend this for prairie reconstruction, is um, you really need to do a good job on those weeds um, and the undesirable plants right off the bat before you try to seed an area or you're going to be fighting weeds the entire time and you're going to be really dissatisfied um, with your meadow that comes up. So you really need to tackle those weeds and get a good planting bed before you seed uh, uh, like a prairie mix. Well, there's an interesting comment here that may be very pertinent given some of the increased winds and problems we're having, but uh, mentioned a farm that's surrounded by native prairie and he's considering our lawn to be a fire barrier. Incorporating oh. native plants into the lawn might be concerning to him. Well, uh, one thing that is, there is, a, I forget what the distance is. There is a fire code recommendation from some uh, association. I, and I'm trying to remember, it's in one of the guides I put. I can't remember if it was 10 or 15 feet or 30. There is a, a distance that's recommended if you're in a fire prone area where you shouldn't be planting tall grasses. But anything sort of short, so if you were to have um, sedges, um, the native grasses that are short, um, you know, the violets and the self heal, that kind of landscape as a fire barrier, that would work. But you would be concerned um, having certainly those tall grasses close to your house. You wouldn't want that. Well, we got uh, Hillary Noonan who's yeah. on with us as of something she'd like to address Don's comment. Hillary, go ahead, please. Uh, so one of the things that happens with native plantings is uh, that you tend to get more carbon stored in the soil 
uh, the more carbon you have in the soil, the more organic matter you have in the soil, the more water you'll hold in the soil. Um, and therefore fire can act very differently. Sorry, I have a, a dog I'm babysitting and my kitten's on the other side of me and I may have a riot any moment. Um, anyhow, the, there's a really interesting place in California that was in the Tubbs fire um, in 2017, I think. Horrible fire, people died, animals died, houses were lost, et cetera. There's a place called Pepperwood Preserve um, and they only have cattle. Um, they don't do any other kind of farming on it. It's silvo pasture, so uh, areas of trees along with lots of um, meadow areas and, and native grasses. When the Tubbs fire came up to the property, um, the cattle went under the trees. Apparently that's their natural response. Uh, but because the soil was holding so much more water, uh, because of the way the, the cattle were moved and the soil, the carbon that was building in the soil, the firefighters were amazed because the, the fire came onto the property. It flashed through the grass, but it was gone very quickly. Um, no people were hurt. No animals were hurt. The trees weren't damaged. They didn't even lose fence posts. It's a very different kind of fire when you have a lot of water in the soil and you'll hold a lot more water in the soil if you have more carbon building in your soil. Um, if, if you're using, um, whoop, well, we'll see what happens, the puppy got loose. Um, if you are using a lot of synthetic fertilizers and, and chemicals and things to kill off your microbes in your soil that are helping to build that carbon by taking it from the plants. Um, but yeah, it can be a very different kind of fire. So you still might, want, might not want those big grasses by the house, um, but if you're building carbon, you'll be holding more water. Um, so I, Okay. I would actually feel safer um, if my soil were healthy. I think that's your best way to avoid fire. Okay. Well, thank you, Hillary. I appreciate you sharing on that. And uh, if anybody wants to contact you, uh, just send me your email too, and we can pass that on. Uh, we're really coming close to the end here. Do we have any final comments from somebody or questions uh, that would like to come up before I close this? I've got an important announcement to make. Okay. Everybody really appreciates uh, it's coming on and thanking you uh, for your presentation, Karen. It was really uh, excellent. And again, uh, if you want to have a recording of this, uh, you'll contact uh, me at the email that's shown there. I do want to say that we are having next week, which is not on the series, but is related to it. Uh, we are having uh, available a, a presentation on the environmental injustice that is happening to native and indigenous folk. Uh, and it's going to be an excellent uh, opportunity to view that and have a discussion uh, at that time. Well, we've got two new messages. I think they're thanks. Yep, there we go. Everybody's thanking. Okay, that's great. So if you're interested in seeing that, uh, why, you know, let me know. Uh, we'll send out a Zoom link and uh, get that. Here, I've got this one, got that. Yep, Evan, I got your... Uh, I'll add you to the mailing. That's good. All right. One last call. Anybody have a comment or you want to get on with something? Yep. Another new message. Hey, this is <laughs> I can actually operate the chat. That's bewildering. Thank you. Another thank you. All right. Another one. Absolutely great. My gosh, I tell you, you got a bunch of groupies, Sharon. Uh, so anyway. That's great. I just want to let you know that she has been so helpful to us at First Presbyterian. We're allowing it, we're converting an unmowed, large unmowed area uh, and to converting it into we'll see what. And Sharon's been very helpful as a consultant on that. And we hope to start uh, doing that very soon to make that uh, conversion. So, yes, definitely sure. give me a call. And I love to get out of the office. So, I think I'm watching what you're doing. That'd be awesome. Okay, okay. And then congratulations, Sharon, on your new position also. 
I think that's thank you. I'm going to be spending a lot more time on this, um, mostly you know, out in the county um, with rural land owners um, who are moving people moving out to the country and they're not growing or grazing um, and want to do a lot of conversion. So it's very exciting. And I'd like to see more. I'd like to see more people in the city doing it, too. So I'm spending a lot more time on this. So, yeah. Well, I want to congratulate Linda McAuliffe. She's talking about her front lawn has been all native plus vegetable garden for seven years. Right. Ah, what discipline. It's wonderful. Okay. All right. I think we're going to sign off. Up. I can't, I can't get away. I got all these messages. Oh, oh Overland Park. Oh, bless it. Oh, I see. That's even special being in Overland Park and doing that. Yeah, I think I get the gist of that. <laughs> okay. Well, listen, uh, Mm. I will send out the power, yeah. as PowerPoint will be sent to also. That's right. I want to say. Well, I just want to say uh, to all of us how urgent it is for us to be aware of the equal justice concerns. And thank you for taking the time. I did recently and sent out to some a recent uh, statement by the uh, E.O. Wilson, who many of you know, who recently died. He made a statement about the probably the largest problem we've got facing us is the loss of biodiversity. Uh, that's even beyond the energy issues and other issues. And so certainly it may seem small, but put together the many, we get something that has a greater effect and it may well be in lawns among other things. So thank you again. And let me know if you have any questions and we can send you information. I'm leaving now and maybe you want to turn in next week. It'll be at nine o'clock also. Thank you. Thank you all.
Friday the 10th, 30.